Thank you, Margareta and Sophie and everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, or good morning. You forstår svenska, men jag är inte så confident uh, in speaking Swedish. So I will take English today, but you can ask, uh, as Sophie said, any questions in Swedish. Um, I will give a short summary of my work on health promotive building design based upon my um, my PhD thesis. A little bit about my background. Um, before we start, I'm a building engineer first, uh, then an architect, but I also teach and I'm recently can call myself a researcher. Um, I've been interested in health related outcomes of building design and mostly healthcare buildings since uh, 2007 during my bachelor's and only since 2015 I've actually heard of health promotion and health promotive healthcare. Uh, today we're going to talk about the core concepts. Um, I don't know why it's going automatically, but uh, so we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the core concepts surrounding this topic about healing and evidence-based design and then also more in depth my PhD research. And I tried to give some directive for the HPH networks and practitioners and a very short introduction to my current projects. Um, so I find it important to clarify the main concepts such as health promotion, settings and the built environment, uh, because I found that uh, we are working in a very multidisciplinary crowd and it can easily that we think that we understand each other, but we actually have very different interpretations. So first of all, health promotion. You are probably familiar with the definition of the World Health Organization, the process of enabling people to increase control over and to improve their health. But there are many other definitions out there and they have different interpretations and there is no agreement to which one is the perfect one. Um, it's also been argued that it doesn't really matter because these differences just uh, give a different focus um, but are not fundamentally different. Uh, however, some people did show also in research that when you implement research, uh, when you implement health promotion in practice, then it can be um, difficult and relate to misunderstanding. So for instance, the difference between health promotion or health education, health information or prevention. All of these concepts are very similar, but not the same. Um, so I rely on the work of uh, Green and his colleagues and they set a list of criteria for health promotion. The holistic view on health, I don't know why it goes automatically, I'm sorry. Uh, holistic view on health, a social cultural perspective, a solitogenic orientation, so a focus on why people stay healthy and resilient uh, regardless of their circumstances instead of preventing disease. Um, equity and social justice, uh, at participation by individuals and communities, and intersectional collaboration. And especially I think the last one is important because it's very complex, uh, but it also requires collaboration between the healthcare sector. And that's of course where I come in as a building engineer and architect. Health promotive settings. Uh, one of the most um, successful health promotive strategies is the health promotive settings approach. And that's basically focused on where health promotion takes place. And this is also um, important in this context to explain what I mean with built environment setting uh, and these concepts. So I rely on uh, Kantar, who says that the relation between setting and built environment uh, can be shown in this model. He says that the setting uh, here is a combination of the built environment, but also like what kind of activities uh, take place and what people expect from that place. So their conception of the place. So for instance, in a hospital settings consists of a building, the hospital, it consists of healthcare processes, but it also consists of what people expect should take place in a hospital. Uh, and that's based upon what they have seen in other hospitals previously. Um, so the physical environment, oh, the physical environment uh, 
is to me the natural and the built environment combined. So it's basically everything that we can see, non-human, and other people have also called this space. Uh, the natural environment are the trees, the, the birds, the ecosystems. And the built environment are the buildings, the spaces and the products related, uh, created by people. Um, so streets, sewage systems, buildings or installations. And building design, what we focus on today, is a type of built environment. Uh, and that includes the layout of the building, the composition, but also interior features like furniture and finishing. And what I learned in my research is that these concepts are actually often mixed up, especially the term physical environment. Uh, it's sometimes used to refer to setting, so more to the left, and sometimes it referred to the built environment. And this is also something that I saw happen in uh, the Health Promotive Healthcare Network and the research. So obviously today we focus on the health promotive settings on the healthcare setting. Uh, so, and that's what I also done my PhD about. And since I had no experience on this, I relied uh, on the work of Hancock. Uh, he makes a distinction between three types of healthcare, uh, hospitals and healthcare services. So the traditional healthcare, uh, which is focused on the treatment of disease with little attention for people. Uh, the healthy hospital, which focuses on the treatment of patients, but also the protection of health of all building users, so staff and visitors, and the protection of the natural environment, because there is obviously a strong relation between the health of the planet and the health of the people. Um, and then lastly, he says that a health promotive hospital is a building where the health of all building users are at focus, but also the natural environment and the community. Um, compared to the healthy hospital, the health promotive hospital has a solitogenic uh, perspective on health. So focused on what keeps people healthy, whereas the healthy hospital focuses ma mainly on pathogenic aspects, so prevention of disease. Of course, in reality, in practice, these things aren't as clear cut. Uh, as they can be in theory. Um, as you know, the standards of the Health Promotive Healthcare Hospital state that the development of a Health Promotive Healthcare should include the creation of a physical environment that supports, maintains and improves a healing process. Um, it also says that it should develop itself into a health promoting physical environment. So that's where, again, that's where I come in. But it's very unclear for me what that actually means. So what I found is that when you actually go into it, it seems that as soon as we started to, to work with the health promotive settings, the built environment is sort of lost in the process or the attention to it. Um, or when the built environment was mentioned, it's often reduced to minimizing hazardous materials, so to avoid uh, toxic, uh, influence or allergies or reducing work injuries. But with my previous experience in healing architecture and evidence-based design, I knew that there would be so much more than just putting like the, uh, the roof, the building to support uh, activities. I also knew from previous research that societal, technological and healthcare developments uh, often lead to new demands for the built environment. So, for instance, the decentralization of the hospitals, of course, also leads to new types of buildings closer to the community. Um, it's therefore important that both building designer and health promotion disciplines should be familiar with this relation uh, to be able to design buildings that support health promotion. A little bit background uh, on healing design and evidence-based design. Um, I'm not the first architect, obviously, to be interested in the role of the built environment for human health. Uh, in the background of this image, you see an architect, one of many, who used to wear doctor's coats uh, because they were so strong in believing their influence on the design of people. Attention to the role of uh, built environment is as old, actually, as Greek ancient history. Um, and you can see temples that were designed 
to heal. And of course, you may be familiar with the work of Florence Nightingale, who also released the sick communities from damp basements, which you see here, uh, to large halls uh, with fresh air and daylight. And actually, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, just before the discovery of antibiotics, sanatoria were designed with access to nature, fresh air, daylight, and their own room to fight, for instance, tuberculosis. So at that moment, uh, architectural design was really incorporated into the treatment process. With the rise of antibiotics and medical developments, the importance of the building was uh, quickly reduced to facilitating treatment. And often there was mainly attention for uh, efficiency and very little attention for the peoples in the building. And I think that this is, this is a clear example of that. But a lot has changed since then. Uh, in 1984, Roger Ulrich did a study where he showed um, the first evidence that the built environment can have an influence on the health of people, and specifically patients. So Ulrich showed with his colleagues that patients with a view on nature compared to those with a view on brick would have less pain medication, faster recovery, and fewer complications. And since then, much more research has been done. So the research right now uh, is so there's so much research uh, and a, a recent review, it's already 10 years ago, showed that a range of building design features uh, relate to different healthcare outcomes and different target populations. So for instance, a building design features, the audio environment, uh, the visual environment, safety environment, wayfinding in the building or sustainability. And behind this, you can read a little bit what I mean with this. This also relates to the patient room. So for instance, single patient room, multi-patient room, uh, family support spaces. Are relatives able to stay? Is there a place for social, um, social interaction and staff support spaces? So uh, ceiling lifts to avoid um, work injury or lighting near uh, medication preparation. This related to diverse types of outcomes, treatment, health protection, restoration, but also collaboration and uh, patient and employee satisfaction. And it related to patients in the beginning and then it expanded to healthcare staff. And now recently there's more attention for relatives and people with uh, diverse abilities, but also diverse um, needs such as children or elderly. The question then, of course, that I thought is, OK, but how does that health promotive hospital that Hancock is talking about, how does that relate to all of this? Because most of what I what I read here and here are pathogenic outcomes, so reducing negative and they have limited attention for the local community, for instance. So my PhD research, I explored health promotion in healthcare settings from a building design perspective. I did four different studies, a literature perspective, a building design, and I focused on the Swedish HPH network and the Swedish HPH organization perspectives. The scoping review, I um, found uh, 4,605 titles uh, that seem to relate to health promotive healthcare building design. But actually, I only found 14 papers that addressed all these topics. Um, and when I was reading them, I realized that there are basically three different perspectives found uh, when health promotion is addressed in relation to healthcare building design. And that's attention for healthy behavior or health equity or a solitogenic perspective. And they relate that, for instance, to health and active design. So that is design uh, that, that promotes physical activity. So uh, the, the stairs in clear sight or uh, walkability around the building. Sorry, that went too fast. Um, and then equity focuses on inclusive or age-friendly design, which uh, pays attention to specific needs of certain vulnerable target groups 
or salatogenic design, which focuses on the reduction of stress. What I also showed uh, with this study or found with this study is that actually these different perspectives have other consequences for the built environment. I mean, this is of course a strange example, uh, stairs to elevator. Okay, is that physical activity for those who need to take the elevator or how is this, how is this okay? Or this fitness where uh, you can take the stairs, but you can also take the escalator up when you're going to the gym. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, so I wondered um, how this could work. Uh, an exa another example is when you're designing for accessibilities, then maybe the elevators are super centrally located as soon as you walk in and the stairs are hidden in the back. Uh, whereas if you design for healthy behaviors, you might push uh, the stairs forward and uh, take the, hide the elevators and thereby stigmatizing those that need the, ele uh, need the elevators. My second study focused on Angered Nershukus, and since you are all in Sweden, I assume that you know a little bit about the project. Um, the hospital offers an example for future uh, hospital development in Sweden, and it's one of the first that it's actually designed to be health promotive. Uh, the hospital facilitates primary and specialized care and pays special attention to health inequality in Angered. This project showed me that it was actually possible to combine multiple perspectives. So they pay attention to both health behaviors and lifestyles, but also equity. Um, when you enter the building, the first thing you see is a huge staircase. And then as soon as you reach the reception, you can see the, the elevators. So without pushing one or the other forward, they create an environment where both are actually uh, promoted. I think that also relates to the design process because they had a very um, participatory design process that included both um, people working in different departments in the in the healthcare, but also patients, the local community, and uh, public health planners. I also learned that there is more different roles for the building design. So first of all, it can accommodate. Uh, health promotive activities, for instance, an educational kitchen to learn to cook healthier. Um, it can support health promotive processes, for instance, by uh, co-locating or making a connection between uh, different units, so it's easier to collaborate, or to symbolize the health promoting healthcare values, so for instance, the placement in the center of the community. Uh, and lastly, I think it's also important to mention that the design process itself has an important role for health promotion as it can help to empower people. Uh, they have an influence on what gets uh, incorporated in the design, but also it helps for the designers to get a better understanding of what the actual local needs are. The Swedish HPH network. Of course, this is a bit scary for me to present to you, um, but at the same time, exciting. Uh, I focused on the Swedish HPH network because when I was doing this PhD and I found that I couldn't, I, I didn't find the answers um, in my normal sources, I realized that the Swedish Health Promotive Healthcare Network could help me uh, find what I was looking for, especially because they follow the HPH standards and thus uh, the need to create a health promotive built environment. And they also have a theme group focused on um, health promoter strategies for the built environment. Um, so yeah, that's why I started studying the network. Uh, I found that the Swedish network indeed incorporates the built environment in the organization. Um, but what I also found and, and again, this is a bit, this is the scary part to say because I know who I have in front. So, um, it, the built environment is not explicitly incorporated um, in, the, in the whole network. So, it's not mentioned in the strategies, the overall strategies. I couldn't find it. I'm sorry. 
I don't know why this happens. Um, I couldn't find it in the other theme groups, but I did find a lot, of course, in the focus theme group. Uh, however, in the focus theme group that that uh, focuses on the built environment, there was so much information that I I didn't know where to start. So, for instance, there is there were links to entire new web pages that focused on healing design for healthcare buildings. And while I think that that it's very important, uh, it often relates mainly to the work of Ulrich, what I talked about before. So it has little attention for healthy behaviors or health equity. Um, so I would say it's actually missing the health promotive aspect. Now it's more healing or uh, healthy. So again, I don't think it's strange. I know that there are very little resources. I know the group consists mostly out of people uh, that do this on the side, not necessarily architects. Um, so it's already great that they work on the healing, the healing side, but I think that there is much more that uh, much more opportunities. And also in my work, I realized it's very difficult um, to find a dis clear distinction between the built environment, physical environment, and setting. So, for instance, the group is called Health Promotive Care Environments. To me, as an architect and researcher, I wouldn't read that as built environment. They do state it, for instance, in, uh, or you, <laughs> you state it in, um, in the ambition, so there it becomes clear. But also in, in a lot of the material that I found, it's not always clear if you're talking about the setting or the built environment or the physical environment. And it would be clarified by just mentioning what do you mean uh, by it. Um, I also interviewed uh, main region representatives of health promotive uh, healthcare organizations in Sweden, uh, hoping to find more answers and also knowing that they work with health promotion on a daily basis and wanting to know how they relate to the built environment. Uh, they are often considered in Sweden as front runners of health promotion. And as part of being a member, they agree to follow the standards, which include the built environment. Unfortunately, I found that they had um, limited knowledge of the health promotive healthcare standards, but I also understood that these are not necessarily promoted in a Swedish network, uh, as I understand that they are um, not so practical. I learned last week um, that they are developing new European and global standards that should be more adjusted to the context. So I think that's a really good development and that they are more practical. Um, a lot of the participants also openly said that they have limited knowledge on the role of the built environment. And again, that's not so strange because they are not educated as uh, architects. But what I found very surprising is that those people uh, that uh, that said that they were uh, involved in building design projects and that worked with uh, health promotion, that they did not necessarily link that role. And I think that that's where there is a missed opportunity, that um, it seems that they are invited to the design process uh, and they are asked for their perspectives, but at that moment, they bring in other perspectives than, than the health promotive perspectives. And that could, of course, be that they just lack the tools to understand what that could be. Um, I don't know exactly why that is, but I think that is something that uh, should be more attention to. Shortly, some combined findings. Let me check the time. Um, I found four definitions of health promotion throughout all of my data, which is very little. So um, I think it's very important to clarify what you mean with health promotion, because it's clear that depending on your definition of health promotion, you will have different outcomes uh, or different directives for the design. I developed my own definition. Um, health promotion as a process devoted to empowering vulnerable individuals and communities to take control over factors that positively influence their health and quality of life, including their social, natural and built environment. 
in this definition, I just highlight uh, that people should be individuals and communities and especially those who are marginalized. I emphasize positivity, so the salutogenic perspective, holistic interpretation of health, but I also clarify that these factors can include the built environment. I'm not arguing that all of you should be using this definition, but I think it's important to pick any definition or create your own definition to clarify what you mean. In my research, I found a lot of different interpretations that could be grouped to these eight uh, dimensions, uh, interpretations of health promotion. So well-being, healthy behaviors, health equity or empowerment, as well as cure, restoration, illness and prevention. Um, so this shows that there's different interpretations uh, depending on the context. I divided these in a, in a circle where you have salutogenic on the left and um, here you have pathogenic. I also learned that the target populations in all of the data is still mainly patients and staff and there's very little attention for relatives, people with uh, different abilities or the local population and very seldom the management is included. Um, and I think this participant of the Angret study says it very clearly, like some politicians wanted a normal hospital, but the idea of Angret uh, Neashikus disappears without, uh, sorry, without a focus on the community. So by combining the eight dimensions and the target populations, I developed this model uh, mainly for myself to understand uh, the, di the diverse complex dimensions, uh, but also to, to understand, to help my students. Um, so here you see the patient, building users, uh, and at different dimensions, uh, and the environment and the community. Um, now I actually believe that it can help a lot of people involved in both building design processes as well as health promotion, healthcare in general, because it may help you to understand, okay, where do I put most of my focus? Am I actually going outside of the circle of the patient? Am I actually staying mainly uh, on this side where it's focused on pathogenic? Pathogenic. Um, yeah, previously I may have argued that health promotion should always include the salutogenic perspectives. So maybe I should only have the left side. However, through my work, I saw that there's so much attention for the right side, the pathogenic side, that it seems weird to uh, ignore it completely. Also, I don't think you can have the salutogenic side without the pathogenic uh, aspects, uh, if it's not safe to begin with. There's different places where health promotion can happen. Uh, patient, staff, healthcare environment, but also supportive circulation in outdoor environments. In general, since there is so little research, I think that the focus should be on um, designing healthcare buildings by implementing the research that we have, but also by doing own research. Uh, it also should involve different stakeholders, develop supportive documentation. So for instance, the HBA standard should clarify that it includes the built environment and consider the environmental impact. Uh, I think this is very well said by someone from the HPH network. I think it was even some, oh, where am I? Uh, big hospitals are always under construction and we are building completely new departments. It would be natural for the health promotion professionals to be involved. So that's you. <laughs> uh, to conclude, specific uh, directives, I don't know who is, it seems like someone else has my mouse or something. I know that's not the case, but anyway. Um, clear directives. I think that uh, the network should debate, propose and clarify their definitions of health promotive healthcare. They should incorporate the build environment in the HPH strategies and should pay more attention to salutogenic perspective communities and vulnerable populations. Uh, there should be more transdisciplinary collaboration within the network, but also outside of the healthcare disciplines. I think especially for the group focused on the built uh, environment, 
you should discuss and select and share the knowledge um, that is needed that relates to health promotion specifically uh, instead of giving a whole um, giving a lot of information which can be overwhelming future research should probably focus on other regions outside of Sweden uh, maybe evaluations of interventions uh, and preferably with health promoter participatory research methods very shortly current projects right now uh, I am researching four different examples of buildings hospitals that I think relate to some aspects of um, healthcare building design. I'm also developing a digital observation tool that focuses on spatial variables in relation to behaviors in the spaces. Uh, so this will be combined with interviews and surveys and diaries uh, to be able to understand how existing words can be designed to be more health promotive. And lastly, I'm applying for funding to develop tools to enable designers and other people involved in the design process to incorporate health promotion into their design. Uh, and this should be a participatory process that it should also involve uh, health promotion professionals and building design researchers, students and practitioners. To conclude, Oh, that went very quick. There is new research on health promotive healthcare all the time, and we really need to be looking into that when we are building new buildings. I think this sums everything up. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I hope I got it a little bit within the time, and excuse me for the confusing slides back and forth. <laughs>